Good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who are in morning time, uh, it's nice to see so many names that I recognize but haven't seen in a long time. Um, hello to you all. And it's also good to see a ton of names that I don't know, which means uh, hi to all of those people we don't know and, and welcome to some of the research that we do here at UMass and in our group. Um, uh, there's a lot of people here who I would have liked to met today under different circumstances, in particular Gates's family and friends. Uh, it would be nice to say nice things about Gates directly to them, but unfortunately circumstance dictates that I can't do that. So I'll try and say as many of those nice things now um, in lieu of not being able to say it in person. So it's really a great pleasure for me to be introducing Gates's defense seminar today. Um, Gates has been part of uh, my research group uh, for, I had to check this, it's, it's actually just a little under two years, um, which is quite quick uh, for a master's degree. And in that time, he's really, quite frankly, blown all of the high expectations I had for um, what we were going to do together out of the water. Um, the, for those of you who don't know me or um, uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I actually left UMass last year. I was an assistant professor there at UMass where Gates is doing his, his degree. Um, and I'm back in Scotland now uh, at the University of St Andrews. And uh, in the transition, in fact, I, I offered Gates a PhD uh, actually before I got offered this position, obviously. And then being offered the position put us in a bit of a predicament because we had to make kind of some challenging decisions about what was going to what was going to go on. We had these plans for Gates to come and, and do uh, something that would be approaching closer to four or five or six years as opposed to um, what we ended up doing. And <clears throat> I was extremely eager to have Gates come. So I was really I was really happy that we were able to come to this uh, this decision or, or, or this idea that Gates would come and do uh, a master's with me and then as the master's progressed we would see what the future would hold and uh, I guess the future was bright because Gates already has a, uh, a PhD offer for Princeton and that's where he's going to be starting in the fall. So I guess as far as Gates and his, his, uh, his dream to do a PhD is concerned it, it worked out well for him. But it also worked out extremely well for us uh, as, as a community at the university, at the program, and, and us as a lab group. Um, you know, uh, the University of Massachusetts, uh, and in particular OEB, the, the graduate program that he's in, have given Gates a really rich environment for him to, to do his research and to, to honestly flourish the way he has done. And I think the program and the university should be proud to have him as an alumni. Um, as as a research group goes, so for me and, and the rest of us in the in, in our in our kind of smaller research group, we tremendous we've benefited tremendously from having Gates being part of that group. Um, of course, there's the research excellence, which you're going to where you're going to hear about over the next hour. But also, he's forced us to raise our game when it comes to professionalism, preparedness, and 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 making some of the slickest graphics and presentations I've ever seen. And not to mention being a constant source of help when it comes to uh, R or programming or statistics in general. Uh, I also think we as a group have learned from Gates that regardless of the system that you work in or the methods that we're using, or in particular the methods that we're using, we should always be looking to identify the theoretical links of our work and, and the broader relevance of the work. And, and I think for us as a group, um, where we work a lot with statistical methods and we tend to get kind of deep into the weeds of those statistical methods quite often, that can be quite challenging. And, and what Gates has brought to the group is this refreshing approach to always try to find the broader implications for, for some of the more statistical work that we do. So I want to just thank Gates personally, um, but also on behalf of the group for being such a positive and engaged member of our group and for contributing to, this, to all of our successes, either directly uh, or indirectly. And I also want to take this opportunity to say to Gates' family and friends that are here today or that watch this video back, um, that you should be very proud of, of what he's achieved in his short time here. You, this, you're not going to really hear this directly from him during his talk, but Gates has completed a master's that has two, practically two published manuscripts in, in ecology, which is uh, one of the most respected society journals in our field. 
Uh, during his master's, he's built strong connections with USGS and NOAA, as well as international NGOs. And he's done all of this in a very short period of time. And, and that's frankly an outstanding achievement. So, so very well done, Gates. Congratulations on everything that you've done so far and, and for getting to this point. And uh, I think I'll just pass it over to you and you can tell us exactly what it is you've been up to for the last couple of years. Thank you, Chris, that very kind introduction. Um, yeah, super nice. Um, yeah, so hi everyone, for those who don't know me, my name is Gates. Um, the last two years I've been in um, Chris's lab. It's been a great experience. Um, I really had a lot of fun and learned a lot too, um, and definitely got everything that I wanted out of the experience. Um, today I'll be presenting my thesis, which is Statistical Improvements for Ecological Learning about Spatial Processes. As I said earlier, this is not my snow leopard picture, but it is a very good snow leopard picture from Shutterstock. <laughs> so three things I want us to accomplish today, just kind of getting started here. Learn some stats, statistics, um, learn some ecology, and also have some fun. This should be a good time, some fun things to see, um, and some fun snow leopard pictures to look at too. Setting the scene, um, understanding the causes and consequences of changes in animal populations is fundamental to ecological questions. But to investigate such questions and avoid spurious conclusions, we need to have good estimates of population size. And this motivates the need um, for the development of rigorous methods to monitor populations. And the snow leopard, which is the animal in the bottom right there, is a great example. Um, we know relatively little about the ecology of this very secretive species. Um, and they're also of serious conservation concern with only around 3,000 ind individuals remaining. But we need better estimates to help guide conservation efforts in particular. Spatial capture recapture, also known as SCR, is the leading method for rigorous estimation of population density. The basic SCR model is built on an implied model of how individuals use space and a model of how those individuals are distributed in space. Conceptualized in the early to mid 2000s, this model is still relatively new with lots of opportunity for improvement. SCR data can be challenging to collect in large quantities as we'll see going forward here. Um, so we need to find new ways to provide data to the model to obtain better estimates of density and any other parameters of interest. So today I'll be discussing two advancements in this regard, um, which were the focus of my master's work and they are sampling design and data integration. So getting to it pretty quickly, um, this is gonna be a, a quick lesson on spatial capture recapture. Um, and some of the parts that you'll see me talk about here, um, I'll continue talking about through the rest of the slides. Um, so some pieces to pay attention to that I'll point out. So going back to the snow leopard example, let's say we wanna sample a snow leopard population to estimate snow leopard density to figure out how many snow leopards there are in a given area. Snow leopards are a good candidate for SCR because they are individually identifiable and individuals have home ranges. And this means that they have a local area that they use to find food or reproduce. You can think of it as kind of like a territory. So to understand how many snow leopards there are, it's helpful to know how much space each individual requires. And we can quantify this area using a simple but special model. This is a statistical model. Here's what that model looks like. It describes the probability, P, of an individual using any location in space. So you can see the animals moving around again, but generally following that pattern. It's kind of a summary of where the animal's moving. In the basic SCR model, for now we can say that space use can be used inter interchangeably with detection. And this means an animal is more likely to be observed in locations where it's more likely to use. This model is symmetrical um, and we can look at it in just one direction. And we see that the probability of the individual using a location in space decreases from the center of its home range. And we call that center point the activity center and it's denoted as S sub I. It's kind of a tiny little yellow font there. And that's just used for statistical convenience. It doesn't need to have a biological meaning. For more detail, we can imagine that we're viewing this model right now from above and we wanna take the, that slice that we're seeing and view it from the side, kind of like a piece of cake. So we're gonna take that slice, rotate it. And this is the same function. And it's really at the heart of the SCR model. So we'll see this frequently in the coming slides um, and something I'll talk about kind of in the conclusions too. So detection probability, which is P on the vertical axis, decreases along the horizontal x-axis uh, away from the center um, at x equals zero. You'll notice this is a bell curve that has been cut in half um, and we call it the half normal model. There are two parameters that work together to change the shape of the curve. P naught describes the detection probability at the activity center, again, at x equals zero. And sigma describes the spatial scale of detection, which is related to the home range 
um, the radius of the home range. We estimate these parameters from the data, um, meaning that we collect our data and then we can guess which parameter values are the most likely to give rise to those data. Um, these parameters are P naught, which describes the detection um, and sigma, which describes space use for the spatial scale of detection. We also estimate density, which is the second part of the model. The idea here really at the root of it is that we can, uh, if we can estimate our probability of detecting an individual P, we can also detect some and, and also detect some individuals. Um, we can estimate population size, which is big N with the little hat on it there. Um, and that's really the number of individuals detected divided by the probability of detecting an individual. So basically to summarize that, if we see six animals and we know that there's a 50% chance that we detect an individual, then we can estimate that we have 12 individuals in our population. But importantly, SCR improves on this idea by making detection probability, so the, the denominator there in the lower part, um, spatially explicit. So uh, we already saw that with the home range model. Um, but moving on, now we're gonna talk about the data and how we can get to this point really. So we can imagine our study area is this presentation slide. And we know that there are some snow leopards out there moving around their home ranges, which is kind of what we've been seeing on little animation. In reality, we don't know how many snow leopards there are. So to find out, we can deploy some cameras. Um, and those cameras are just devices that take photos of individuals at different points in space. And from those photos, we can identify different snow leopards or something else like tigers, um, anything that's individually identifiable or something that's already been marked. Snow leopards have spots. It's kind of like a thumbprint, but across their whole body. And each snow leopard has a unique pattern that we can use to identify it. So here are those cameras. Um, now we can keep track of which individuals are detected on which traps. And the simulation is just one sampling occasion. We can say an individual is detected if it overlaps with the camera in our little toy example here. So I guess going forward here, pick your favorite snow leopard, A, B, or C, um, and see where it's detected. Keep track of that. And I'll summarize it too. I'm gonna move a bit faster here. Snow leopard B is detected on trap three. Snow leopard A is detected on traps four and then trap two. Um, and now we can basically organize this detection information. We can make a table where each row is a snow leopard and each column is a trap. The corresponding value in the table is a zero if the individual isn't detected or one if it is detected. Um, so A is detected on cameras two and four. It gets ones, uh, it gets ones in the cameras that it's detected at and zeros in the cameras that it's not detected at. This is the recapture part of spatial capture recapture. So it was detected or captured on trap two and recaptured on trap four. Recaptures help us estimate P naught, which is the detection parameter. And then further recaptures at separate traps like this one on trap four uh, also help us estimate sigma or the scale of the home range, the spatial scale. B is detected on camera three and that really helps to increase our sample size and snow leopard C is too far away, so it isn't detected. Um, and that also kind of helps us give, get an idea for um, space use of each individual. And that's a really important part of SCR that some individuals aren't detected because they're too far away from the traps. We can start to get an idea for territory size from the pattern of these encounters relative to the distance between the traps. So we know the distance between the traps that we don't know is how big a territory is, but we can kind of relate the two. So territories are at least large enough in this example to have detected individual A on cameras two and four but not much bigger since individual B was detected on only camera three. We can call this table Y, the observation matrix, and it's indexed by rows and columns, which are I and J. So each individual gets an I for its row and each camera gets a J for its column. Now that we've formalized our data collection, we can describe the system or kind of the data that we've been seeing here with a statistical model. And this is the most basic SCR model. So individuals are represented by their activity centers, again, S sub I, and those are distributed uniformly or randomly across the study area, which is big S, also known as the state space. The observations in that observation matrix um, or the table Y are dependent on the activity center locations and are the result of a Bernoulli trial with probability P. A Bernoulli trial is a coin flip, um, but instead of a 50% chance of getting heads, for example, this coin is weighted and it's weighted by the probability P. And if you remember, P is the detection probability. And this is the really important part of SCR that we'll see going forward. Um, P decreases with distance from that individual's activity center as described by P naught and sigma. And that again, on the left there is that curve. So summarizing this, kind of bringing it all together. 
SCR is a model of individual space use, and that space use is related to, detect, to, uh, related to detection. You can see the model over there on the right. Um, space use provides a spatially explicit representation of the area being sampled. That area defines the detection probability, and hence it provides an objective or unbiased estimate of n or density. But in order to estimate the spatial scale of detection, we have to estimate sigma. And as we saw in our toy example, to estimate sigma, we must detect individuals at multiple traps, which are also known as spatial recaptures. So you might notice that this description that I'm providing now is leading us a bit. Um, you might be putting together the pieces uh, that the quality of our estimates depends on where we sample. So it's really a sampling design problem. We can improve our estimates by having a better sampling design. And that idea has really been the focus of my first chapter, um, which is on optimal sampling design for SCR. It's my first data chapter, a collaboration with my advisor, Chris, who we've met um, now at University of St. Andrews, Ali Nawaz, who is from the Snowbird community, very well known there, and Andy Royal from USGS. So why focus on sampling design? Um, well, so that we can answer a different question, really. And that question is, how well will we be able to estimate um, what we care about, which is often density or abundance? In other words, will we be able to get a good estimate? And the answer to that is really yes, if we have an expectation of the data that we're going to collect. And we can build that expectation by having good guesses for P naught and sigma from the literature or pilot studies. That gives us an idea for home range size, which we can use to figure out how far or how close our camera traps need to be to each other um, relative to individual home ranges. So in statistics, the quality of our estimate is mostly a function of data quality. And our group here today has a good sense for SCR data from our toy example. You should be feeling good about that. Um, as we saw, there are three components to SCR data. And these are pieces that you'll recognize now. They are the number of captures, the number of recaptures, and the spatial pattern of encounter histories, which are also known as spatial recaptures. This means that there's a trade-off among these elements, though. We want to capture a lot of individuals, um, but we also want to have a large number of spatial recaptures. So where individuals are, oh, that's where individuals are captured on more than one trap. Um, but these objectives are competing, right? So you can't get a lot of the captures, but also a lot of spatial recaptures because that kind of has traps going in two different directions. Um, we can't do both. We need something in the middle, something that's just right, which is why I like to refer to this as the Goldilocks paradigm of design for SCR. So some general ideas here, but let's see what that really looks like um, in practice. So these are both the same area. Um, and that, that's shown by the light blue area there. It's the same number of traps, which are the crosses, um, and the same number and placement of individual home, range, home ranges, which are in red. On the left, traps are spread out, and we detect a lot of individuals, but only on a few traps for each individual. So you can see it's seven individuals captured on average at 1.1 traps. On the right, we only capture a few individuals, but we detect those individuals on a lot of traps. So when we have three individuals that we capture, and we capture each individual on average at 5.66 traps. This is really the basic idea. Um, previous research has been helpful in providing guidance on how to manually create designs within a rectangular grid like this, um, but there aren't any formal approaches for sampling design in irregularly shaped areas, um, which are far more common than rectangles. So in real life, it would be kind of, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a sampling occasion that I mean, it might be a field or something like that, but in most cases you're sampling a forest plot um, or some mountains in Pakistan, for example, which I'll go into here. So one of those regions that motivates our research is uh, this area. And shown in red there on the left, it's part of the Astor region in Pakistan. The country of Pakistan is shown in white on the right. And we're sampling for snow leopards, which are on the western edge of the snow leopard range in yellow, which is shown there from IUCN. The study area shape is irregular. And further, it it's, has snow-capped mountains and river valleys, as well as military bases, which means a lot of areas cannot be sampled. So after accounting for that, we're left with the resulting possible sampling locations on the right. Um, and that looks quite different than the previous slide that we saw with the square areas and the regular grids of traps. But these are just possible trapping locations. Let's say you want to sample this area. Even knowing how big a home range is, what would you do? Um, following previous recommendations, it's really impossible to know the best design since we can't use a rectangular grid. So we can't follow those standard rules of how far away traps should be from each other. There are some other recommendations about cluster designs, things like that. Um, but those are really hard to carry out in situations like this where the possible trapping locations are so irregular. So to solve this problem of optimal design in irregular areas, we present a new approach. 
And it's really a design finding approach. And it has two steps. The first step is that we identify a sensible design criterion. And a criterion is really a measure of how good a design is, of the performance of that design or the expected performance of that design. And that criterion can tell us the expected information content of the design based on our understanding of home range size and, and detection. So that's again, back to the idea of having good guesses for P naught and Sigma. Then we formally optimize that criterion over thousands of possible designs using an algorithm. Um, so these are the really the main two parts and I'll go into these in more detail in the next two slides. So we can dig in. So identifying a sensible criterion, our framework is flexible in that it can utilize any criterion based on the SCR model, composed of P naught, Sigma and density. We propose three criteria here that explicitly leverage the encounter process. We think these are especially good criteria and they follow naturally from the SCR model. Um, in particular, they follow from the ideas of captures and spatial recaptures. So criterion one, we'll call the space filling criterion. That's how I'll refer to it going forward. It maximizes the probability of detecting any hypothetical individual at least once. And really it's about captures. Criterion two is the space constricting criterion. It maximizes the probability of detecting an individual at more than one trap. So it's really about spatial recaptures. And criterion three is a hybrid approach. It simply combines those two criteria into one. Um, so those are our three criterion. Those are things to pay attention to going forward. And now we're gonna move on to how do we derive these criteria or these measures of design performance, expected design performance. And we're kind of going back to the basic idea here, the heart of the SCR model. So using the detection function, we can plug in X values. And those are distances from hypothetical activity centers to traps. Um, and we can get back Y values or detection probabilities. We can do that a bunch and organize the results in meaningful ways to tell us how likely we are to detect any individual in a set of traps. So rather than creating and evaluating designs manually, we use an algorithm. They can do a lot more in a lot less time. That's the main idea of why we'll do it. So here we adopt a genetic algorithm, which is one of the first uses of this specific algorithm in the field of ecology. We package this in an R function, which is SCR design GA, which I'll show in a minute. But we're gonna go into exactly how this algorithm works, but kind of in a general sense. Um, so let's say we have 50 traps. This algorithm starts by generating a population of designs. Let's say hundred designs, and they're totally random designs. They're just traps placed anywhere, selected randomly from the computer. Then it scores those 100 designs using the criterion and it selects the top designs, the ones that perform the best or that are expected to perform the best. So let's say, say that it selects the top 10% highest rated designs. It then breeds those 10 designs together, swapping pieces of them among each other to generate 100 new designs. The process then repeats for as long as you want it to. We recommend about 1500 times for this part. Um, I'll show one more iteration here just so we can see what it looks like. So it scores and selects the designs, it breeds new ones, and then um, scores and selects again. And then 1500 iterations later, it terminates and it returns the best design. That's kind of the main components of the genetic algorithm. Um, it follows from some ideas about evolution and genetics, but we're gonna see it in action here now. This is the space filling criterion. Um, and the gray area is what we're sampling. This plot will move in a moment. The small gray dots are the possible trapping locations to select from, and the bluish larger dots are the traps that are selected. So what you'll see here is that the design starts off totally random, then through time, the pattern of the design emerges. In this case, the traps fill the space evenly, not regularly in a regular grid, but they still fill it evenly. So we can take a look at this now and just watch it. You can see it's going through and this sort of even pattern starts to emerge around now until eventually the design converges on its optimal design, which it was just shown there in black. So the point here is really that the pattern emerges from complete randomness or apparent randomness using this algorithm. So we have an R function um, in the package Oscar, and we can use that to generate designs. It's pretty simple. You can see pretty much all the code for it right here. Um, and this includes the study area components, the number of traps, and the parameters of the species and the related design criterion that you select. Um, we're gonna go into those criteria in a bit here, but the main point that I just wanna communicate is that it, it's really simple. Um, we've, we've done a lot of work on this, but we've also packaged it in a really neat way. Um, even the help file where we have the little vignette of how many of how to go through the code um, is pretty short. It's like not even 20 lines or something. 
So we can see what these designs look like now, um, kind of seeing the characteristics of the designs that we have an idea of which designs we might want to use in different circumstances. So the first one is the space filling criterion. And again, that fills the space evenly. This is pretty much the same as the one we saw before, but just in a, in a, right, uh, in a regular area so that we can uh, get a better sense of what it looks like and away from any effects of irregular areas. Um, it should detect a lot of individuals. That's really the, the point here. It's filling that area, making a lot of room to detect a lot of individuals. Then we have the space constricting criterion. Um, it samples a smaller area, which you'll see there. It should get a lot of spatial recaptures though. The traps are pretty close together. They're not filling out the whole space, but by having traps close together, we can get more spatial recaptures. Then the hybrid approach does a little bit of both. It spreads out like the space filling criterion, which you'll see it kind of fills the area, but at the same time, it has some clusters of traps like the space constricting criterion. So the space filling cri criterion doesn't have clusters, but the hybrid approach does. The criterion tells us how well the design performs relative to a single objective, so relative to captures or recaptures. Um, but to get a more comprehensive understanding, we use simulation to evaluate design performance. Simulation is kind of a, a jargony word, but we're going to get into what it really looks like right here. So we start with our study area and our designs, which are colored there. Um, in this case, they're each of the three designs. And then we simulate some individuals. We generate capture data, as we, fought, as we saw before. Um, it's the table that we called Y, the observation matrix. Then we recover estimates of density using SCR. And then we measure performance by seeing the difference between the simulated values and the estimates. Um, and that's really the beauty of simulation. We generate the true value ahead of time. That's what we did on the left. Um, and that's so that we know how well we did in the end, which is what I'm showing on the bottom. This measure in particular is called bias. And bias is something we want to minimize. We want no bias. So a bias of zero is really what we're looking for. Um, so we can keep that in mind when we look at our results in the next slide. So we have bias on the vertical axis. The bias of zero is shown by the horizontal black line with reasonable bias shaded around it in gray. We made designs with three levels of traps, 144, 149 traps. We expect performance to be worse as traps decrease. Um, and the three designs are again, space filling, which is in fuchsia, space constricting, which is in blue, and the hybrid design, which is in purple. The confidence intervals show 50% of the core estimates. So onto the, the real main results here, we can see optimized designs perform very well in general. Um, with few traps, criterion two remains unbiased and that's the, uh, the space constricting criterion. And that's really great to see that we have an option for uh, times when we have limited resources. Um, criterion one and three, uh, that should say, struggle at low effort due to extended trap spacing and sparse arrays. Um, and not shown here, but precision and accuracy follow these trends. And we found that these designs are also, they perform well in regular areas and with other kind of issues thrown at them. So some take home points. Where to sample depends on the SCR model informed by the species ecology. Uh, previous recommendations aren't very helpful in irregular realistic sampling scenarios. They're helpful to some degree to inform theoretical developments of sampling design for SCR, but in an applied sense, they can be more difficult, more challenging. The SCR design GA framework produces a greater amount of expected information leading to more accurate estimates. And the framework is flexible, so it can be used for any species in any study area, and it can also be used with new criteria. Um, and kind of building on that here, we could have alternative criteria that account for spatially varying density, which is something that Chris and Ian Durbach from St. Andrews have worked on um, as an extension of this, of this uh, framework. And we could look at multi-species sampling. So we could have separate parameters for two different species and try to sample them simultaneously, kind of interesting in predator prey systems, something like that. Um, and that's something that I've been working on with colleagues, particularly in South Africa, working on sampling leopards. And then um, sampling of multiple data types is kind of interesting too. And this is also kind of leading us to the next chapter here, but sparse cameras can be used to detect individuals. So we could have traps kind of spread out in the space filling design, but then we wouldn't get a good estimate of sigma. So instead we could use telemetry data or GPS data to estimate sigma. And for more information, I'll direct you to my website. Um, and on there, you can see that I have a bunch of additional materials. These are what they look like. The materials come in several forms. They're vignettes and help files a recorded lecture workshop or a workshop lecture um, and the paper that we published in Ecology that Chris mentioned earlier, which is also available freely on BioArchive. So a quick breather, that's kind of the end of chapter one. I'm gonna take a moment, take a drink of water.
Chapter two um, is on blackbirds, obviously, um, and it's on telemetry informed cost functions in SCR. This is a collaboration with Dan Linden from NOAA, and again, my advisor, Chris. And this chapter is on integrating data from things like GPS collars into the SCR model. Cost functions are really about landscape resistance, which is about animal movement. And I'll try to explain that in more detail in the coming slides. Movement is really the primary mechanism of response to environmental conditions, uh, such as moving to cooler or warmer areas, um, or such as predators moving towards prey. So interspecific interactions, interactions between species. Fundamentally though, movement is structured by the landscape. And this concept is termed landscape resistance. Um, and resistance is really one way to think about it is that it's a reconsideration of distance or thinking instead about functional distance. So for a really kind of simple example, something that's pretty relatable, um, if you wanna cross a river and you wanna get from where you are to right across the river, it can actually be faster to take a bridge that's downstream rather than swim straight across the river. So even though the swimming path is shorter, it's gonna be easier to just take the bridge. And that's kind of what we're thinking about here in terms of landscape resistance. The river is providing some resistance to your movement and the, the bridge kind of helps you get around that even though it's not the straightest path in terms of how the crow flies. And this is something that's really important. So for example, in a big paper published in Science, which is a really big journal, um, the author showed that we can detect how landscapes structure movement at a global scale. Um, so here we see that areas with a greater human footprint were home to mammals that moved around less. And that's likely because they had less space available to them. Um, but what we want to know is how this works at a really fine scale using animal movement data um, and estimating some parameters. There are a few methods to do this though. Um, previous methods have mostly been imprecise or not informed by relevant data, instead relying on things like expert opinion, which is a great first start, but we're moving towards a more data-driven age where we should start looking at some models for things like this. Um, simultaneously though, data integration has grown rapidly in popularity. And one especially complementary method is the integration of telemetry data with SCR. So as I said earlier, we saw that SCR methods collect just a little bit of data on a lot of individuals, but excitingly telemetry data collects a lot of data on a few individuals. Importantly though, in motivating this research is the idea that there is no method that combines data integration with estimation of landscape resistance. And that's kind of what we're, we're going to do going forward here. So here's our setup. Um, this should look pretty familiar at this point. You might even know where I'm going with it. But we can use the camera traps to get a little information on a lot of individuals and telemetry data or GPS data to get a lot of information on a few individuals, in this case, just one individual. The main thing to notice is that the distance between the camera traps is, is kind of far relative to the distance between each step that we're seeing in that GPS telemetry track. Um, but we have to model these data types mostly separately but we can combine them by estimating a parameter they have in common. And that parameter is called cost, it's landscape resistance. And again, it's that reconsiderization of distance. So we can actually see what that looks like in the coming slides here. So let's say we have a road and that road is shown in red there. Um, and an individual's activity center sits right next to the road, which I'll plot in the next slide. And we can use this as a model of the home range. So that looks pretty good. Um, but what, what we notice is that the road is incurring a cost on the individual's home range. The bear doesn't want to cross the road, which is for obvious reasons, um, it's kind of risky to do so, so it'll try to stay away from it. But that ends up playing a role in where the bear is going to use its space overall. So we can remove the road and we can see what it's doing to the home range. So we can look at that um, and we can see that the home range is no longer symmetrical. So it now follows kind of the contour on the road um, or of the road on the, the bottom right side there. We can see how this works by comparing paths to two different pixels that have the same probability of space use. So these two paths should be the same distance to each other, but because the road is incurring this cost on the animal, um, it, the path to that one pixel on the right is shorter than the path to an equivalent pixel on the left. Um, and the equivalent pixel, the path there doesn't have to go through a road, so it can be longer. And we use cost as a way of defining an equivalency between distances like this. And we call this reconsiderization ecological distance, which is what I have titled on the top there. So here's how we include that in the model. We have the detection function. We've talked a lot about this at this point. It uses distance. We can see that in the model there and along the x-axis. But simply, we can, we can swap in ecological distance here. Pretty slick. Um, and what's not shown is what's under the hood in our calculation of ecological distance. And that's what's known as the cost function. It's just three lines of code in R, carried out by the R package, g distance. Um, conceptually, 
we estimate the value of a parameter that allows us to bend space in a way that makes our data the most likely. Um, so that's our model for the SCR data with ecological distance. But what about the telemetry data? For that, we have to use a separate model. And that's kind of what I was alluding to earlier. And that separate model is something called a movement model or a model of animal movement. So the movement model for telemetry in our movement model, we want to understand where an individual is going next to move after each consecutive step. Um, we start with a track like this. And the individual has an activity center, which is denoted as SI again. Um, and the individual right now, though, is at position U. So SI is yellow, U is in the top right in red. And we want to know where the individual is going next. So which one of those points will it choose? We can use the same model. Uh, well, we can use the, the home range models to describe probability of the space use in the home range, which is something we saw earlier. Then we can use that same model, but shrink it to the size of each step and center it on the individual's current location. So the probability of where the, the animal moves next can be calculated by adding these two models together. So we can drill down through those, those blue curves and calculate what the overall probability of the next step is. Um, so let's look at it in a different way. Where the individual moves next is a function of the distance from its current location plus the distance from the activity center. So we know the individual is going to want to move back towards its activity center, but it's also not going to want to move too far away from its current location. So kind of got to keep both of those in mind. And we can use, um, we can translate this into a, a formula. And the important thing to notice is that we can also include ecological distance in this formula. Um, and we can use this ecological distance in both the SCR model of the home range and the movement model. So that distance is estimated from a single cost function between the two models and that cost function estimates the effect of landscape resistance or the resistance of some habitat type to movement. Just as we did in my first chapter, we'll use simulation to evaluate performance of this method. So we start off by generating a cost surface, which is a, a study area that has um, some spatial structure to it. And it has camera traps, which are noted as crosses here. And individuals have activity centers in the landscape. The black box that's plotted there is an area that we'll zoom in on to see one individual that we simulated. And we do that by generating a movement track within the home range following that movement model that we showed in the previous slide. Um, and we can record that track as the telemetry data. We can then collect the same data um, for the other part of the model. And every time the track overlaps with a camera, we record that as a detection at some standard probability. So we have one data type, and then we have the second data type. And the second data type is the SCR data. Um, again, it should look familiar as the observation matrix in the top right. Um, the dark circles are where the animal is detected, and the inset number shows the number of captures on that track. So we have SCR data, we have movement data, and we can move forward with our, our integrated model. We want to see how our new model compared to other models. It's kind of a, a standard comparison. Um, so we compared performance among the four, among these four models that I'll show in a moment. Um, we use simulation, and we also used a case study. So we could try our model out on real data. The case study data were collected on black bears in New York State. I'll show that in a moment. But to go on to these four models here, we used the non-integrated standard SCR model using Euclidean distance. This was the one that was created quite a while ago, a few years ago, I guess. Um, then the non-integrated SCR model using ecological distance, which was um, published in 2012, I think. The telemetry integrated model with Euclidean distance, which is a version of our new model. And then our full model, which is the one we're really excited about, shown in blue here. And that's the telemetry integrated model with ecological distance. Um, and that one was evaluated using case studies and simulations. So using these models, we can do simulations, case studies, and compare the results, kind of like we did in the previous study. So here are the simulation results. Um, we compare the non-integrated model, which is in red, and the integrated model in blue. Um, and these are models that include ecological distance. These are not the models that don't include ecological distance just for now because it's the simulation results. We again evaluate using bias. And the main plot is for our cost estimate. The inset plot is for our density estimate. And the inset number within each um, color there is the number of collared individuals that we include. So collared individuals or telemetered individuals, uh, basically the number of tracks that we recorded to use in the model. Some takeaways. Integrating telemetry data improved estimation of cost. SCR data alone was not able to recover an unbiased estimate of cost, but it's important to consider the simulation design here, which provides some nuance. Um, I'll put in a plug here to read the paper to hear about that in a bit more detail. 
Adding data for more individuals showed little improvement. Um, and that's because the model was doing really well already. So you can see incorporating five individuals or tracks from five individuals, it wasn't a lot different than including just one track in terms of the precision and uh, the bias that we're seeing there. And finally, uh, estimates of density remained unbiased. So we know that we can reliably estimate both parameters at the same time. And that's really important. We want to be able to do both of these things at the same time and understand how one affects the other. And we were able to accomplish that here. This is the, the bears case study, some data from that. Um, so it's on black bears in Western New York. Um, the green background shows the forest covariate. So areas that are darker green have more forest, areas that are lighter green have less forest. Um, and then there are, there are the camera traps, which are the crosses. As we've been seeing, that's a fairly random design, which is kind of interesting. Um, and then we have the telemetry tracks of three individuals, which are shown as blue, uh, red, and purple. And that's basically all the data that we need for our model. And that's what we use the integrated model for. And this is where we're comparing the four models to. Um, but we'll only talk about two of them here, really. Uh, we saw similar results from the case study. Integrating telemetry improved estimation of cost. Uh, you can see that there are smaller confidence intervals within this little subplot here. Um, SCR data alone was not able to recover significant estimates of cost. So the estimate overlaps zero with a, a pretty large confidence interval, whereas the, uh, the integrated model did not. Adding more telemetry to individuals showed that variation among individuals should be considered. Um, so you don't want to rely on just one telemetered individual if, to include in your model because individuals might vary in how they respond to the landscape. Um, for example, bolder animals might have less of a response to the landscape. They might feel like um, there's less resistance movement, whereas other animals might feel like there's more of a response that they have to, to use, basically. And again, density estimation remained unbiased. That's what we're showing in the bottom left there, and that's really good to see. So some closing points on chapter two. First, data integration is a promising approach, especially when the process you want to understand is fine scale. And that was the case with landscape resistance, because landscape resistance operates at a very fine scale. Um, that forest covariate, as we saw, is pretty fine scale, and we want to understand how that all works. Um, so we can use a data integration approach. Integrating telemetry data via movement model was a perfect fit in this case, providing more information by using an explicit model of the movement process and how landscape resistance works within that process. Future research could focus on using a more direct treatment of multi-scale selection, um, which means selection uh, in the home range versus within the movement path. Some methods are already out there for this, and those could be easily included in our framework. We presented a fairly straightforward movement model, but there are more sophisticated ones out there. So some future directions building off of that, as I was saying, more sophisticated movement models, especially those that allow for variation in fix rate. Um, so we assumed that the fixes were always regular. Um, for example, the bears, I think it was hourly fixes. But um, it, there might be times when a, a fix is missed, so a, a, a detection from a GPS caller is missed. Um, and you might have a two hour gap between consecutive fixes. Um, we assume that wasn't the case, but you, there, are, there are models out there that allow for that. So you can also have a more direct treatment of multi-scale selection, which I talked about. There's a certain paper that does that that I think would be cool to integrate. We could do exploration of spatially varying density together with landscape resistance. Um, from the same surface, we could look at how um, percent forest makes um, spatially varying density or makes spatial variation in density um, together with landscape resistance from that same surface, which right now you can't really do because they're confounding and in different parts of the model. Um, ecologically examining resistance within home ranges versus during dispersal events could be interesting. That should say Zellerol uh, 2012, not 2021. Um, and th this would be pretty neat. It's mostly been done in metapopulations, things like water voles and um, frogs, I think. Um, but looking at it in larger animals would be, would be a cool and exciting next step. So finally, this chapter is more recent. So we're working on getting materials out there. Right now we have a manuscript and we'll be including this model in Oscar. So we hope to provide some documentation on it in the coming months. That's the end of chapter two. Just a few more slides here. Um, Closing with some discussion points. I learned a lot during my time in the Southern Lab group, um, as I hope I was able to demonstrate here today. I'll close with two broad takeaways, though. These are technical details that I came to realize are really important, but at the same time can be overlooked quite easily, and I'll carry them with me throughout the rest of my career. The first one is that if you want your new method to be widely adopted, you should try to make it familiar. So if you step back for a moment, you realize that we spent a lot of time going back to that detection function that I'm showing in the bottom here. 
In chapter one, we used it to calculate design criteria. And in chapter two, we used it to describe step selection in the movement model. And it came from the heart of the SDR model where we use it to describe the home range. So when we saw it later, it was familiar, we could understand it quickly, and importantly, we could start using it without having to read a whole other textbook or something. Second, um, a lot of thought goes into the simulation design for method studies like this. I'd say often that's where the majority of our energy is spent. Um, but I've learned it's worth giving those simulation designs a second thought. So in brief, simulation studies can be a bit circular. Typically, the model that we use to simulate data is the same as the model we use for estimation. This can be fine in some cases, but in other cases, particularly with more sophisticated estimation models, such circularity can create blind spots in our evaluations. So in the design chapter, the evaluations were simple and the circular approach was adequate. And uh, in the data integration chapter though, parameterizing the model was tricky. So coming up with what parameters we should use and how they should relate to one another was, was challenging. We ran into problems that we would have missed if our data generating model had been circular and self-fulfilling in the way that it was in the first chapter. I wasn't able to talk about that in, in detail today. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll again use this as a plug to check out the paper when it's out, um, but certainly food for thought and something that um, I'll think about going forward. So with that, I'd like to thank a lot of folks here. First and foremost, Chris Sutherland, my advisor, um, co-authors, Dan Linden, Ali Nawaz, Andy Royal, my committee um, who are on here today with us, Joe Elkinson, Tony Lynn Morelli, and Dan Sheldon, um, Sutherland Lab Group, the UMass OEB community, family and friends, of course, many of you are on here today, really appreciate it. And then for funding, the UMass OEB program, Panthera, the Sabin Snellberg Grant was a big help, um, and the Snellberg Foundation and the Snellberg Trust. So with that, happy to answer any questions and my email's there if you wanna send me an email or my, uh, my Twitter handle. Thank you. <laughs>